Well, um, good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much for spending the next 90 minutes with me, and I will walk you through uh, some of the stuff I've been doing uh, in the, you know, the space of explainability, but primarily focusing on you know, Rexus systems, um, as in recommendation engines. Um, maybe a little bit about who I am. So my name is Ade, uh, Ade Ido. Um, I'm a software engineer and data scientist at Credit Suisse. Uh, actually started off as, you know, as a software engineer the last uh, 15 years thereabouts. And um, you know, the last five years thereabouts, I've been focusing on machine learning and data science. Um, and those are my details, basically, if you want to follow me. Um, before I go into the agenda, um, just to kind of give some, you know, some, uh, some intro, really, to why I'm, I'm doing this work. Um, a few years ago, um, I was tasked with trying to solve a problem to do with model explainability around recommendation solutions. I mean, recommendation engine solutions that we've built, um, actually built by our quant guys um, at Credit Suisse. And, and the problem was that although they built you know, recommendation engine um, and it worked really well, unfortunately, uh, as you can imagine, in the area of finance, it is important that what the model is doing, what it says it does, must be explainable, or else you have a trust deficit. In today's talk, I'm not gonna go into you know, the work we do at Credit Suisse, for obvious reasons, but I will be using um, open source data sets uh, known as movie lens by group, uh, I think it's by group lens or whatever they're called. And essentially the models that I'll be exploring are kind of similar to what I built at CS, but has nothing to do with you know, what I do at Credit Suisse, okay? So I just want to kind of call that out. And the other disclaimer as well is that um, I will be focusing on primarily collaborative filtering models, not content-based filtering or hybrid forms of um, you know, um, recommendation systems. That being said, the structure is as such. So I'll start off by you know, providing you um, you know, um, essentially, you know, what are recommendation systems? A very brief overview of that. I'll provide um, a kind of a dive in into collaborative filtering, primarily matrix factorization systems. And then uh, we'll briefly talk about <coughs> explainability in AI and primarily focusing on recommendation systems. Then we will do a very quick uh, sort of exploratory data analysis of the movie lens data sets. I'll do a much more in-depth analysis when I do the demo on that. Then I'll walk you through a number of recommendation system exp um, explainable models that are out there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'll then provide some, you know, some demos. I think I've got about six or seven demos. We'll see how time kind of uh, evolves. <laughs> but hopefully I should be able to kind of walk you through all of that. And then, of course, we'll have a Q&A session. So I'll start off with um, you know, the sort of what are the different types of recommendation systems that are out there. So generally, there are two types. There, I mean, there's a collaborative filtering approach, and there's a content-based filtering. And then, of course, uh, in, in some cases, there's a hybrid of the two. And then you know, for um, typically, collaborative filtering is sort of also divided into two groups, model-based as well as memory-based. And I'm not gonna go into too much about model, um, um, I'm not gonna go into too much on the memory base, but the takeaway is memory base is where you're essentially leveraging, you know, the k-nearest or neighborhood uh, kind of attributes, uh, either of the item that you're recommending or the user. Uh, so typically with recommendation systems, and the two key components are the items and the users who you're recommending to. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on model-based approaches. So, just, I guess, just to kind of get a bit more color on the difference between the two types of um, techniques for making recommendations. On the left there you can see is collaborative filtering, which is typically where you've basically got two users that kind of share similar appetite. So, if both of them kind of share appetite for a particular item, like what's shown there, the books, green and red books at the top, 
then it's possible that if um, you know the person on the left there, which uh, if I can use the word, the woman on the left there, if she's already consuming the book shown there at the bottom, then it's possible that the guy on the you know on the right will be, and the guy on the right will be. Sorry, I think I'm getting there. Yeah, and so it's possible that the guy on the right would be um, interested in what the woman is um, consuming. If you then contrast that with what's shown there on the, uh, you know, uh, um, here, which is shown here on the, on the right, is content-based filtering, where essentially it's predicated primarily on similarities between items. So what you typically do is you will measure some kind of similarity metric yeah, between items, and then items which are similar. If, if, if the guy shown here is already consuming this, guy, uh, um, this item, then if there's similarity between this item and that item, then it's possible that he might also be interested in you know, that item. Yeah. And then just to kind of delve further into different types of recommendations, they are um, a number of ways to do recommendations. So the very kind of classical way is, as I said earlier, is to have your user item interaction matrix. So you have this matrix that defines typically on the y-axis would be your users and, and on the x-axis would be your items. And then obviously you have some way to indicate a measure of, like, um, measure of appetite. Sometimes we call it a rating to identify you know, which user prefers a particular item or not. So that's your kind of typical approach. And that's what you tend to see in most circumstances. But also, in some cases, there are cases where context is quite um, important. Where, for instance, not only are we interested in just the user item interaction, but we also have features of either the user or, or item also um, being built into the model. Um, in some cases, we also have situations where the data is not kind of static in time. It's actually a sequence. So you might have... Um, you know, what are called the session-based recommendation systems in, um, in which you basically have a session or a sequence of information and thus you're making recommendations um, where you also have a time component uh, built in. And finally, um, there is this growing area of knowledge-based recommendations where essentially there are, uh, not only do you have a user item interaction matrix, but you also have an, a sort of affiliation to external data that relates to the user and item. And typically, that external data is some kind of knowledge graph of some sort. And then, as I said earlier, I'm going to be focusing on collaborative filtering. And really, what I mean by that is I'm going to be looking at matrix factorization. So the basis of my presentation today is all about the user item interaction. So what's shown here is essentially, um, you know, you have. Uh, as I said earlier, you have the user shown on the y-axis and the item shown um, you know, on the x-axis. And essentially, you have you know, these, these measures or, or ratings that are usually ascribed to the, the user item interaction. And the key thing here is we are trying to build a model that will compute these unknown ratings. That's essentially what we're doing. So, how do you do this? Um, so, we're going to use, as I said, matrix factorization. What does that mean? Well, actually, in um, linear algebra, we all know about things like uh, singular value decomposition, which is a matrix could be decomposed into its components. So, here, you actually have the opposite. So, here, what you have is you have the original matrix shown here uh, on the right. And what we're doing is we're kind of working backwards. So, we're basically trying to decompose this matrix into two much lower dimensional matrices, where the first one, shown here on the left, is the user uh, latent factor matrix, and this one, shown here on the, uh, in the middle, is the uh, item um, uh, latent factor matrix. And you know, what kind of binds these two things together is the lower dimensionality, which is shown here, so, if, so, so so along this axis here, this would be the, uh, what's sometimes known as the rank dimension. And along here, in the item space, 
This would be also known as a rank dimension. So you can see that by decomposing the original matrix into these two, then you can then kind of iteratively solve for the unknown ratings by doing this simple calculation here of the two matrices, and then that will give you the predicted rating of the unknown. Um, there are other ways to do you know, matrix um, factorization. So I'm focusing on you know, the simple stochastic gradient descent, but there are other ways. So as I said earlier, classically you do it using SVD or, or even the SVD++, which is a much more kind of scalable performance way of doing this. Uh, and of course, there's ALS, uh, alternating least square, which is something that's done typically for scalable um, matrix factorization. You, and you see this a lot in um, Spark or, or PySpark. Yeah? Um, so typically that's what they do, you know, where you've got distributed computing. Uh, and then, of course, there are other techniques like non-negative matrix factorization and some other kind of techniques that try to hybridize both the factorization of the matrix as well as the neighborhood um, concept. And of course, more recently, there's been a, a whole kind of um, uh, sort of array of deep neural network variants of MF techniques. Okay, so if we kind of go into a bit more detail on how does this work. So as I said, it uses stochastic gradient descent. We all know what that is in machine learning. It's, it's kind of ubiquitous in a lot of what we do, yeah? So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically solve some kind of cost function or an error function. And in this case, we have the original values that, um, and we have the, this stuff here, which is the predicted uh, values made up of the two latent factor matrices. Yeah, you know, the, um, the user and the item matrices. And the idea is to iteratively solve this using, st um, using stochastic gradient descent. Okay, and we do that by basically, you know, for each of these user item components or matrices, we're basically, you know, we're up updating the values by, you know, you know, applying a learning rate multiplied by this term here. And as you can see, this term also embraces um, some kind of uh, regularization uh, term as well. So that regularizes it. Um, and then we do the same thing as well for the item piece. And what's shown here on the right is just essentially pseudocode, which is pretty much explains the same thing I just said there. In the background is showing you a real performance uh, metric that was computed uh, when we ran this uh, stochastic gradient descent. Okay? And again, um, I should mention for most of my slides, I try to provide you know, references. So yeah, please, if I forget to mention them, just yeah, please have a look out for that. So, I'm now going to digress and talk about explainability. Why do we need explainability? So, now we've got a model. We've got an MF model, matrix factorization model. It's very good at predicting unknown ratings. But how do you explain what's going on in the black box? So, this is a, um, a major theme in AI and ML. Okay? And we know why this is essential. As I started off the talk, I said we built a solution many years ago to recommend uh, financial products to our clients, but why is it making those recommendations? What is the intuition behind it? Yeah? How can we trust that this thing is doing what it's meant to do? Yeah? Um, so this is why we need explainability, and I'm sure you guys have seen this in uh, you know, uh, pretty much a lot of uh, presentations. So again, typical. Typically, the kind of attributes we want from an uh, AI or decision, sy um, decision system is it needs to be transparent, it needs to be effective, trustworthy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? Again, that's the reference on that. So, what we basically have is we have this dichotomy here of you know the two worlds. One of the you know the black box that's doing a great job. It can you know um, you know does the right prediction, but it's a black box. It's completely opaque, and then. On the right, we have where we want to be, which is some kind of AI that is completely transparent. It works, but also it tells us why, how it works. So the divide is that, you know, currently, if you simply just have an MF, sorry, a matrix factorization solution, without any, any explainability, then it doesn't tell you the why. You know, why did it do that? Why not do something else? 
So the essence of building explainability on top of your model is to essentially you know, answer these questions here shown on the, uh, the right. And this is kind of where we want to be. That's further emphasized with this graph here. So, so generally, there is this sort of trade-off between model accuracy or performance, shown here along the y-axis, and model explainability, shown on the, the x-axis. And typically, most of our classical you know, um, ML models, things like linear regression and you know, decision trees and rule-based you know, expert systems, they tend to be highly explainable but maybe perhaps not as accurate as the more sort of growing area of deep, you know, deep learning models, which usually are very, very high in accuracy, but you know, still, still work in progress in trying to get these things explainable. Of course, in the last few years, there's been a lot of work done in systems like Lime and, and Sharp and Sharpie and whatever to try and make you know, deep neural nets explainable. But this is the problem we're trying to solve. And where we want to be is, hopefully in the future, we want to be somewhere around this region where our AI is not only is it of high performance or high accuracy, but it's also fully explainable. So I'm now going to digress a bit. So we kind of agree that we need to build AI that is explainable. And we also need a semantic or some way to express explainability. And that's kind of what this is trying to say here. So there are various ways of you know, being able to, um, you know, to sort of communicate explainability of an AI solution. So, you know, you start off with a very basic sort of user style or item style. What does that mean? That means, you know, you see that sometimes with Amazon, you know, because you bought this item, we also recommend in a whole bunch of other items. So, so that's typically like a user style explanation. And then you have other forms of explanations such as, you know, um, you know feature-based you know, um, explanations where essentially it's looking at certain features, certain you know, of the user, maybe features on the user um, user or on the item. You have some of these can also be um, opinion-based explanations where you're looking at uh, typically also that's also, also sometimes referred to as social explanations where you're not only looking at yourself but you're looking at how you compare with other folks who might share certain traits with yourself perhaps some kind of social, um, almost like a social media um, kind of um, thing, whereby you've got a graph of people that share similar traits. And, that, and so we recommend blah because other folks like yourself also consume blah. And then we have, um, with the growing area of NLP, we also have cases where the explainability is actually either, uh, it's a generative NLP model that would generate text to explain how the model solution had evolved. And in some cases, we also have visual explanations. I've got a couple of slides that just kind of walk you through some of these things, but I'm not going to do out too much on these. You can have a look at the, uh, the references that I provided. So here's a slide that's showing you, um, I think up here is showing you cases of um, you know, um, user-based and item-based. Yeah, so there you can see. I mean, um, I'm not going to sort of dwell too much on this, but and then you can see along here you have uh, cases where we're using text to sort of explain what's going on, and then finally uh, along here we, you know we've got some visualization explanation styles. Yeah. So the number of ways, and, and this is very very critical because in the end, explainability is going to be consumed by the end user, who is a client, has nothing to do with. It. ML. So they don't want you to give them a lime sort of, you know, graphic which is explaining what, you know, how the model works. They want something very simple that is easily intuitive. And here's another example. Um, again, this is, uh, you know, just showing you uh, cases here where uh, you've got a user item style um, um, explanations. Uh, sorry, user slash item explanation style, and equally, you've got a similar thing there. Uh, this is quite interesting. This is a case where you've got textual um, style explanation. So here we actually got sentences, and then you're you know, using the word clouds to kind of emphasize 
you know, how the model works. And uh, here's another one where, you know, we're using um, a visual style explanation. And here's one where it's sort of based on, you know, um, some kind of social graph representation of users. So, as I said earlier, you know, if you're part of the same graph, you know, the machine is recommending this item because you, you know, you share something in common with the rest of, you know, your neighbors. Okay, so that kind of gives us a very high level perspective of why not only are we trying to solve the problem of recommendation using the black box, but we also need a mechanism to be able to explain what's going on in the black box. So I'm now going to walk you through what I did. So, so of course, as I said earlier, I'm not using uh, any sort of uh, um, private data. I'm going to be using open source data. Movie Lens is a well-known data set. It's, I think, I think it was created by uh, Group Lens. So it's, it's been around for a long time. In fact, Group Lens do a lot of work in the recommendation uh, engine space. So the data set for Movie Lens is quite broad. Uh, I've only focused on th actually two, not, not even three, but I'm showing you here three data sets. The first one that's pretty much the main one is the interaction um, matrix. So there you can see uh, you've got the user item and rating information. Uh, and of course, typically this will be pivoted so that you can create a matrix of some sort. And then on the uh, right here, you've got the, uh, the movie or item data set. So this is basically showing you the item and all of its affiliated um, fields. Yeah. And then finally, at the bottom here is the, um, is the user information, where you've got demographic information, you know, the age, etc. If you look at the, I mean, I mean, if you go to the Group Lens website and look at Movie Lens, Movie Lens comes in all sorts of flavors. I've only used the 100K version of Movie Lens. I think it actually goes up to 25 million um, in terms of the size of the data. I've only used a 100K version. And as I said, there are other data sets, including metadata, that I've not used for this analysis. OK, so now that we understand the data, and I'll provide a bit more color on some of the uh, data exploration uh, findings during the demo. The next step now is for us to try and articulate exactly how do we want to build this explainability onto our model. So classically, there are two ways of doing this. So the first approach is what's known as um, a model-based approach. What does that really mean? Um, so essentially, this is where the explainability is part and parcel of the model that's doing the actual prediction. So, so essentially, the explainability is baked into the model that's doing the prediction. And so sometimes it's referred to as intrinsic uh, based or you know, um, sometimes it's, it's referred to as um, anti-hoc um, anti approach. The converse approach to this is where you decouple the explainability component from the model. And that's what's called the post-hoc approach. And generally, there are pros and cons in how you choose any one of these two approaches. Typically, the model-based approach is very difficult because what you're doing effectively is you're considering explainability as part of the prediction solution, and that is not always very straightforward. I mean, you could envisage trying to do this in a deep learning model. It's quite involved. The second approach, generally is a lot easier because it's completely decoupled from building your recommendation engine. You're now just building a layer on top of the recommendation engine that does the explainability. And it's kind of akin to uh, what you see with things like Lime, for instance. You know, Lime kind of, you can bolt Lime onto pretty much most models, yeah? Because all it's doing is just a, you know, some kind of proxy or, or surrogate, yeah? Which tries to explain the more complex model with a very simple surrogate. Okay. And again, um, 
these are the references. Just to kind of further elaborate this, uh, this point, so you have your uh, anti hoc, which as, as I said is model based, is built into the model itself, and you have your post hoc. And then of course, these two could either be providing you local explainability or global explainability. So that's another thing to just take note of. Okay, so now I'm gonna home in on exactly what was done for this problem to do with movie lens. So in terms of the, um, the anti-hoc or the so-called model-based approaches, I looked at two techniques. So the first one is you know, this um, ALS, alternating, alternating lead square approach. So if you remember earlier on, I talked about stochastic gradient descent as one way to solve the, the matrix factorization. ALS is another way to do something similar. And I will provide a bit more color on that shortly. The second approach is what's known as the explainable matrix, factoriz uh, matrix factorization. And the paper is sort of, um, I'll show you that shortly. And so both of these techniques were implemented in a library actually um, a very good library called Ricker Explainer, where they basically implemented the findings of the two papers you know, which these techniques were based on. So, model-based explanation shown here schematically. So there you can see you have, the, uh, you have your data set on the left there. Uh, typically, it's just a user item interaction matrix, but optionally, it can also include side information of either the item or user. And then you have the black, um, you have the, okay, I would call it a white box because it's explainable. So you have the white box, which is made up of the MF model and the explainer, all kind of coupled together. And then, of course, you, you, know, you do the explanation, um, sorry, you do the, you solve the, um, the matrix factorization solution. You then do ranking to get recommendations. And then, of course, there's also those two functions are then linked to how you explain the ranking results. So it's quite straightforward, conceptually. And, and then if we sort of delve into the ALS explainer, how, how does that work? So generally, um, you know, it's, it's predicated on a key thing here, which is the ratings are not explicit, or should I say the feedback. So think of ratings or appetite, the measure of appetite, as feedback from the user. In this particular case, these are implicit. So typically, ALS works fine when the feedback is provided implicitly. Either it's a click, yeah, or number of trades, in our case it was number of trades, etc. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing to take note of. It also works in cases where you have got explicit ratings, but you have to do some kind of uh, pre-processing to, you know, to convert those uh, typically floating values or floating point numbers into binary numbers of ones and zeros. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then um, ALS, as I said earlier, it is a well-known technique that's used for highly scalable um, sort of processing of, you know, um, 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 of MF, basically, of the mixed factorization solution. Um, and then, again, very similar to stochastic gradient um, technique. Um, again, you have a cost function here, as shown here. And as you can see, you have this piece here, which is where you're trying to ensure that the predicted is close to the, sorry, that the the actual is close to the predicted, okay? And then this term here is where you're basically <coughs> applying some regularization function to basically, you know, to, you know, to ensure or to penalize any sort of, um, you know, um, overfitting due to these two terms, yeah? And again, it is simply very similar to the last approach. You're just simply doing an update, although it's called alternating because you're alternating alternating the updates for both the user latent matrix as well as the item. And then you put those two together and then you end up with this 
solution here, and then this gives you the predicted rating. Uh, for more information, you can look at this, uh, this paper. And then um, one of the benefits of this approach is that um, you get for free, you get this, this, uh, this matrix here, this, uh, this matrix, which, which actually embodies or encapsulates the item by item similarity, which is quite key for us, because that could then be used for explainability. Yeah. And then here is actually a real result, which I, which I provide more color on during the demo. So this is a result. So you can see here, this is a recommendation. And then it's just telling us that, well, this recommendation is close to these guys, these items. And it's just giving you some measure of how close they are. Yeah? So that's what you get. OK. We now move on to the second approach for model-based um, explainability. So the second approach is this um, EMF. So EMF is uh, essentially based on identifying similar users on, of items or users. Um, it, again, is based on similarity of the user um, or item. But more importantly, it, it also brings in this concept of neighborhood. And here's, um, I mean, here's an example I pulled out of the paper itself. So there you can see what it's doing there. Yeah. So it's just saying that you know that your ratings are similar to these movies, and then it provides some kind of score. Yeah. Or you know you can do it the other way around. You can say that you are close to your neighbours based upon this score. Okay. And then in terms of the internals of it, um, so here what we're doing is we're solving this expectation function that embraces um, you know the um, essentially it's measuring um, the distribution of either the user or item, how many times a particular user for an item, sorry, for a, a user recommending an item, how many times is that item close to its neighbors? Ooh. Sorry, okay. And this is done on both sides, both the user and the item. Again, for more details, you can have a look at this paper. And then, again, the key thing here, again, is that we have this this, this term here, this matrix that we're going to use. And this matrix, again, embodies explainability. And again, it features also in the cost function. So here you can see that's the matrix there. And you see it's been used to kind of uh, to tune, you know, this term here, which again also embodies the, reg um, the regularization term. So essentially, it's ensuring that it's bringing these two things together, so that these two, the difference between you know, both the user latent factor and the item are not further apart. And again, as I said earlier, we solve J, this cost function, iteratively um, you know, by doing updates on both the user and the, um, the item components. And I think the takeaway is this W that we would use to basically put a measure on similarity. And again, I'll show you this when we do the demo, but essentially what you get out of this for free is you now, not only are you using your MF, which makes a factorization, one of the byproducts of that is that you decompose the interaction matrix into two components, the item latent factor and the user latent factor. But now you could also use that to, uh, as, as a sort of an item style explanation, to actually explain what's going on in the black box. So, so, so what's shown here is essentially this graphic is basically showing you um, when you take the item latent factor, which is obviously of size K, or should I say it, it, it's of size number of items by K, so it's a matrix, you then reduce that to two-dimensional space so that we can visualize it, so you get this sort of thing. So in this particular case, we've used um, one of the, um, you know, the dimensionality reduction techniques. I think I use UMAP here. And then what you're seeing here is the blues are basically all of the uh, recommendations. And then the purples, or different shades of purples, are uh, explanations. And then the X here, actually what I've done here is I've also overlaid not only the item latent factor, I've also indicated in the same space the user just one point of the user, which is this guy here, and you can see the interactions, yeah? But this suddenly provides 
at least from an analysis perspective, this provides some level of explainability that you can then use and provide it in a much more simpler way to the client, as shown earlier. Okay, let me pause for a minute. So, so far we've talked about model-based um, ex um, explainability. And as I said, model-based explainability essentially is about coupling the recommendation engine model with the explainability model. The two are completely in, um, inextricably linked together, which is good. We're now going to digress now and move on to the converse approach to doing this, which is, as I said earlier, post hoc. Post hoc, as you can see here, is you have your interaction data, you use a model to train it, and then make predictions, you get recommendations, okay? And then we also have, completely detached from the black box, we have a surrogate model, okay? And the idea here is for this surrogate model to basically explain what is going on inside this black box. And the only thing the surrogate model knows about is the output of this black box as well as the recommendations made. And it will then be able to make explanations for us. Yeah? This is conceptually very similar to what Lime is doing and, and Sharp or Sharpie, yeah, pretty much. So it, 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 from an implementation point of view, it is a lot much simpler because it doesn't need to know anything about the black box, okay? But there is a trade-off. You do lose some level of explainability um, accuracy because of this detachment between the two. Okay, so for the work I did, I looked at three variants of this approach. So the first one is something known as association rules. It used to be a very, very popular approach to doing data mining many, many years ago. Uh, it's quite powerful, actually, and very, very explainable. Uh, the second um, approach is what's known as KNN explainer, which kind of tells us what it does on the tin. It's, it's using, you know, sort of KNN as a surrogate to explain what the, you know, what the MF is doing. So KNN, we know, is a neighborhood approach to doing, um, you know, to solving, um, I mean, to do recommendations. So it's using that as a surrogate to explain what the more black box thing is doing. And then finally, um, I actually like this approach. Uh, this is um, a variant to matrix factorization, known as factorization machines. And why this is very powerful is because factorization machines would allow you, not only do you have the user item interaction matrix, but you, it allows you to have side information. If you remember, you know, right at the beginning, I talked about con, um, I, I talked about contextual, no, sorry, context-based recommendation systems. Yes, an FM is a is a context-based recommendation system because it allows you to bring in side information that either relates to the item, as well, or the user, or both. And suddenly, you can see the parallels between that and maybe a linear model. So now you have some kind of model that allows you to bring in all the features and then spits out some kind of... So, so, so think of your model as f of x, where x is the big x of, of all the features, and y is the predicted. So suddenly, your fm allows you to do the, you know, um, y is equal to f of x. And then suddenly, with that, you can use lime. Because although the, the, uh, the factorization machine is still complex, when it spits out the Y, you could then use a surrogate using a line approach to bring in a linear model to explain what the FM is doing. And we'll get to know more about that shortly. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the association rules. What is association rules? So association rules is this kind of, um, some of you might have seen this, this thing that there's an association between bear and diapers. You know, uh, so folks who buy beer actually also buy diapers <laughs> for their kids. <laughs> um, this is actually a classic, uh, um, um, a classic truism in a way. You know, it's well known, and actually it's based on this model known as association rules. The early recommendation systems were 
used to be based on association um, you know, um, rules. And basically what it means is that you can have transactions, being, um, um, and so you have a number of transactions which are part of a catalog of items, and then what you're doing is you're basically trying to build association rules that links one item to the other. And typically what you have is you have on the left, you have what's known as the uh, antecedent, and on the right you have what's known as the consequent. And if you parallel that to what we're doing on the recommendation side, the recommendation would always be the diapers, you know, we're recommending the diaper, and then the, and then the reason is why. That's the antecedent, okay? So that's kind of what we're trying to do here, yeah? For further details, you can, again, uh, this is um, uh, two good papers that explain a lot of the, you know, what's going on. And here's a graphic that hopefully I'll try and see if I can explain this further. So what you have is you have your classic um, item, sorry, user item matrix or interaction matrix. You feed that into your black box, your FM model. Again, similar to what we are doing before. Only difference now is FM uh, is going to have to do a one-hot encoding of all the values. So there is some level of pre-processing you have to do to your data sets to make it um, presentable to the FM model. But apart from that, it, it's, it's pretty much a black box. Then it spits out the predicted ratings. Those ratings are then essentially um, you know, would be used and ranked to give recommendations. So here you can see B, C, D. Okay, equally, we then pass all that information now back to a completely decoupled model, which is the AR. And the AR model, what it's doing underneath the covers is it, it, it's using data mining. Um, I mean, there's several ways to do this, but it generally um, one technique is to use this um, a priori algorithm to figure out that for all the items, it, it will basically spit out rules of the antecedent consequent pair, as well as metrics to indicate how well those rules have been computed. Typical metrics will be support, confidence, and lift. And then basically, this is then further filtered so that we get the highest, um, um, we only keep the top D or, or, or top K rows, and then with that, you now have ex your, your explanations for the recommendations as shown here. And again, I'll kind of go into this in, um, shortly during the demo, and this is a typical example of this when you run it. Okay, next one is uh, post hoc KNN. Uh, again, honestly, this is pretty much similar to the last one. Only difference here is that we're using, um, you know, K nearest neighbors as our surrogate rather than AR, you know, rather than um, association rules. So it's pretty much similar. The, and the takeaway is that when we do KNN, of course, you're measuring similarity between items. So here we're using cosine similarity. For further details, it's again in this uh, paper, but I'll give a demo on that as well. And that's the results I obtained when I ran this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of quickly walk through the last one. The last one is this um, FM, um, sorry, this FM Lime uh, explainer. And as I said earlier, um, so, so FM is a factorization machine. Um, actually, I think I made a small mistake earlier. When I was referring to the, to the to MF, I was actually talking about FM. Sorry, in the last slide on AR, I was meant to say MF, sorry, I, I get a bit confused with the FM and MF, but essentially the black box you saw here, let me just correct that, sorry. Yes, sorry, so let me just correct that. So this black box is MF, sorry, MF, not FM. This is just a normal classical, classic um, MF, okay? Now we're going to go on to FM. And FM is a, a variant of MF because FM is where you can bring in side information because it's a context-based model, okay? And um, the only difference really is that when you do FM, because you're bringing in side information, you need to reshape your data set. Uh, primarily, you need to um, 
essentially, you need to do something like this. So you can see here, you have to have the user features encoded as a one-hot encoding. You have to do the same for the items, and then you have to do the same for the side information. In this particular case, side information is the genre of the movies. And then, of course, you have your output. This is the only thing you need to do. This is the only difference. And again, it's a very sparse matrix, but this time very sparse, but also with a lot of ones and zeros in it. Yeah? OK? And what are we doing here? So obviously, as I said earlier, if you use the analogy of the y is equal to fx, so in this case, with solving y is equal to fx, the f is the, is the fm model, the x are all the features, and the y is basically the rating. And to get the y, we need to estimate the coefficients of our f. And that's what we're doing here. Yeah? And again, you know, again, it's classical stuff. We have, you know, we're basically trying to reduce the error, and then we have this, reg uh, this regularization term. And then this is the full workflow. So again, you pass in your, your one-hot encoded uh, data set. That is then used to make a recommendation, I mean, to predict the rating. The rating is then um, um, essentially then explained through this surrogate thing here, which is Lime. So I'm using Lime here. Although when I did this, I had to kind of hack Lime a little bit because Lime only works for, you know, for general models, not recommendation systems, but it's quite straightforward. So we basically hack Lime so that Lime understands uh, how to connect this this, uh, this y is equal to fx model, and then explain it. And of course, as we all know, Lime is making explanations based on feature importance. How does the feature, what are the, the features that truly explain the outcome of the model? Yeah, and, and, and that's it shown there graphically. Yeah. Uh, and for further details, yeah, you can read this paper. And again, this is the outcome from my, you know, from the, the demo. And maybe just before we wrap up, before we go into demos, um, what we're shown here is uh, just a series of metrics that are quite critical to what we, you know, to what was done here. So obviously, for the FM, uh, for matrix factorization, we're using a classical mean square error. Yeah. Uh, typically, I think when I ran it for maybe how many iterations? Maybe about less than about 100 iterations. 100 epochs, I should say, it's typically about between 0 0.6 and 0 0.5 was what I was getting. Uh, I'm sure if I run it a lot more and play around with hyperparameter tuning, make sure that the regularization term is also being, you know, being, being tuned correctly, I can probably do better. But, you know, uh, it was fine for the demo. And then we also have a bunch of um, metrics for recommendation systems. These are all classical ones, hit ratio, uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain. Yeah, um, I was going to add the formula there, but it's actually it took too much space. But you can check that; it, it, it's well known. Then, in terms of uh, explanation metrics, we have a bunch of ways to measure how well is the um, explained result. The one I think which is quite intuitive for me is this one, which basically looks at the overlap between what's been explained in terms of items and the actual recommendations divided by the total number of recommended um, items. This is quite intuitive, I think. Uh, the, this one I didn't find very intuitive for me. Uh, this is what they were using in, the, in, uh, in Rico Explainer, which is the library I was using. Um, still trying to understand how this, how this really measures explainability, but it, yeah. Um, this is used for some of the, the explainable models. And then finally, for the FM model, as I said, FM is very similar to linear models, so you know, the, um, the, um, the fit, um, what's it called now, fitness of, goodness of fit, thank you very much. R squared is, w was used there, and R squared, as shown here, is computed like, like so. And just before I wrap up, before we go into demo, what do I want to do in the future? If I had loads of time, I, I, I started this journey about two years ago, and I remember when I looked at the, <laughs> the work, this space is huge. There's a lot of research in this area. And I'm barely scratching the surface. The, the models I just showed you there are really kind of entry-level models. There's a lot of 
other work that can be done. But I guess in, the first thing I'd like to do is to do a proper comparative analysis of the results I've obtained for the, um, you know, for, for the FM approach, compare that with the AR approach, because they're kind of similar in a way, but they're both post hoc. I didn't have time to actually you know, present those findings. Um, I would also like to, right now, the, the FM Lyme approach is only doing local explainability. Lyme is essentially a local explainability. What Lyme does is Lyme takes one single sample and it tries to then take samples around that sample and uses that to explain what's going on within that neighborhood. It would be nice to actually have a more global explainability model that can tell. So I think, you know, Sharp, um, it'd be interesting to see how I can adopt, uh, sorry, how I can adapt this to Sharp. So I'd like to do that. And then really, where I'd like to really be is this cutting edge place, which is using knowledge graphs. Why knowledge graphs? Well, in the recommendation space, knowledge graphs are really, really big now. Yeah? And the reason why is because they provide a wealth amount of external information. Information that not only are you using the user item interaction matrix, but you're using all of the external data, metadata, that relates to the user item. And if you bring that in, you get complete understanding of what's going on. And there's a lot of work done in the space. And there are a number of papers I've read that I've been trying to, uh, try to implement, but you know, they're you know, kind of involved. Um, one particular one is this paper here, I think. Uh, yes. So um, these are models that kind of are transformer or attention models. Uh, also, they embrace a lot of graphical neural networks. So they take the graph and they obviously they embed the graph, which is why they have a GNN layer. And then by doing that, they, they then have the graph now represented in a more lower dimensional uh, space. And then that then allows them to, to compute the recommendations, but not have recommendations in the traditional sense of just something being recommended. You now have a graph. And then the graph path itself kind of impl implicitly is explaining why has it taken this path. So if you couple that with reinforcement learning, you suddenly have a very formidable way of providing explanations. So, so, so this is one area I'd like to explore most definitely in the future. And again, just to kind of, uh, you know, just to kind of further emphasize that last point, this is uh, an, an extract from a paper. So there you can see this is the knowledge graph and, you know, um, the graph is then sort of embedded somehow. And then what they're doing is they're using, you know, reinforcement learning to compute the policy. Yeah. And then, you know, with that, they're providing some kind of explainability. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of do further research in this. I, I mean, this is something I, I still haven't completely grasped myself, but I definitely think this is the future. Okay, so I think I'm doing well for time. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to now go through a series of demos. Um, I have, as I said, seven demos. But before that, I'm also going to walk you through the code on a very high level, just a high level to show you the, the project I did in, um, I mean, I use PyCharm, but I've got the demos are in notebooks. Okay? And as a precursor to that, these are the key libraries I used. So I'm not going to go into so much detail, but you can see that some of these are very familiar, others are not. These are the libraries I use. So just bear with me now. Let me get my act together here and try and walk you through the code. Okay. So, so this is the code. And it's basically made up of configs. That's fine. I mean, that's typical. Data access layer. This is how I basically pulled the movie lens data, did a whole bunch of stuff on it, pre-process it so that it's ready for us to do, you know, the machine learning bit. Uh, obviously, demos is essentially where I put all the demo stuff in there with some utility stuff. The notebooks, so the notebooks I'll show you shortly. Uh, visualization, all that graphical stuff I showed you there is all done via this, you know, the modules in here. And then, of course, explainer. Well, that kind of does what it says on the tin. That's got all the 
you know, the code for doing expl um, explanations. Uh, uh, login is just got all the logs. And then the model is where we're doing pretty much all of the, the MF, matrix factorization, um, as well as factorization machine. So those two models live in here. And then, obviously, once you've done the, once you've computed the ratings, you've predicted the ratings, you then need to rank it, make recommendations. So that's what's done in this folder here. And then, uh, more importantly, I used two, so apart from the libraries I showed you earlier, I also had to hack some code. So one, of, and the first one was Rico Explainer. I had to basically hack the codes you know, to make it, you know, to adapt it to my use case. So that's what's in this third party folder here. So I've got Rico Explainer. I just pulled that from Git, the master. And I've also had to hack another piece of code called Lime, uh, Lime underscore RS. Although I think in the end, I just pulled out the code and just created my own sort of module because I couldn't really use theirs. It wasn't. So that's pretty much the code. But as far as you're concerned, you will be looking at now the actual demos. So if you, and all this is in my instructions, how to get this set up. I think a number of you already managed to get this working, so that's great news. I think, I think I spoke to someone earlier and they managed to get it working. So that's good because, I mean, I was panicking a little bit. <laughs> I was, originally, I was trying to do all of this, move it all onto Colab, but I, I, I wasn't successful. So it's good that you guys can recreate this on your own machines. Okay, so basically there's seven uh, notebooks and I'm gonna walk you through, the first one will be the exploration, sorry, the exploratory data analysis. That's the first one. Second one, I'll walk you through the ALS model. If, if you recall, ALS is the alternating lead square. Um, essentially, it is a model-based approach. Um, so for the second demo, I will just quickly just show you how to run it, but not using cache data. Some of these runs take a long time. So for the other remaining five models, I'm actually using cache data or else we'll be here forever. Yeah, okay. So let's start with the first one. So the first one is fairly straightforward. It is just basically me just doing some exp exploration of the code. So as I showed you earlier, this is the um, interaction data that just pulled off, you know, uh, off the data access layer, which I showed you earlier in the code. So what I'm doing basically is the, the notebook is just a client. Most of the heavy lifting is done in the code and I'm just calling you know, in, in instantiating objects within the notebook. So up here you probably notice that there's a bunch of user defined um, modules that I'm calling to do all the stuff. I'm not going to run it because of time. I, I don't want to run this, but I just quickly run it through it. You can run this in your own time. So the first bit is the interaction matrix. Second bit is the um, the movies or item data, as I said earlier. <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, the only bit I used here were the genre information. So uh, it doesn't show you everything. Yeah. So I've used all of this genre information, like is an action movie, adventure, animation, blah 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 blah. Yeah, that's what I've used. And then, just for completeness, it I also pulled in the uh, user information, although I didn't use the user information. So there's, out of the five models I've presented so far, only one of them uses side information. Again, let's go back. What do I mean by side information? As I started off this discussion, everything I've done is basically using collaborative filtering. And collaborative filtering based on matrix factorization. The key ingredient for doing matrix factorization is the user item interaction matrix. And that's what I've used for pretty much all of the four models, apart from the one model, which is the factorization machine, which takes in context information. And that's where I've used side information. Specifically, I've used um, the genre information of the movie data. So hopefully that's very clear. Okay, so when I run this guy, um, it just spits out a bunch of reports telling you, I mean, I'm not gonna bore you. It, it, it does all this stuff here. To be honest with you, I haven't done that much work here because I'm just borrowing off uh, this very, very powerful um, library here. 
which is part of, um, I mean, it's aligned to pandas. I, I think I only knew about this two weeks ago, but yeah, it's quite, it's quite powerful. It, it basically does the EDA for you automatically and gives you a report, so it's pretty fine. It, it's quite good. So that's what I've done here, and it spits out all of the EDA's key things. So I'm not going to bore you with that. You, you can have a look at that. Gives you correlation, blah, blah, blah. More importantly, I've also provided um, information on uh, some of the key, um, I guess, findings in terms of what the data is telling us. So for instance, you know, what are the common movie genres? Well, we can see here that drama seems to be the main movie genre, which is quite interesting. Um, this one here is telling us, you know, you know, just showing us a profile of the movies, which one has the highest uh, rating in terms of numbers. Yeah, it's showing you there, and it's showing you when. So that's around just before the noughties, I guess. And then um, here we can see a distribution of movies based on you know the age. So again, please in your own time have a you know um, you know have a look at this. Again, here's another one here, just telling you you know you know which kind of um, occupant watches uh, more movies. So there you can see it looks like students are the ones who do most of the movie watching at least as, as per this data, okay? And then here, you've got another one here, gender breakdown or gender distribution. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into much on that, but you know, that's another important one there, and then et cetera, et cetera. And then you know, here you've got things like top 10 rated movies. So Star Wars seems to be quite a very popular movie. Uh, and then by gender, it looks like, um, uh, our female um, folk or, or, or colleagues, you know, prefer um, things like, uh, I mean, The English Patient, as you can see. And I guess, uh, is there one for males? Yeah, male Star Wars. So males tend to be sci-fi. I'm not sure how accurate this information is. One, it's only 100K. The big data set is 25 million. Two, it is very much historical. It, I, think, I think it ends around the beginning of the, the noughties. I'm sure things have changed since then. So, again... This is purely a machine learning exercise, not a, not a psychological one. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next um, uh, demo. The next demo is where I'm basically doing a full run of the, you know, the entire thing. So I'm doing, I'm solving the mixed factorization solution, then I'm doing recommendation with it, i.e. ranking, and then I'm doing explanation. And uh, when I, you know what, let me try and run this uh, from scratch. Let's see what happens just to see. Okay. Okay, there you go. So it's doing the first one is MF, then it's recommending. As I said, this is purely for demo purposes. I've reduced the number of epochs to a very small number so that it runs very quickly. So again, yeah, the numbers here won't be as accurate as the cached ones. Okay, right, so that's just doing the whole full run of the ALS approach. Okay, next one now is where I'm doing a much more accurate ALS approach and where I also provide, um, I also provide explanations of what the model is doing. So again, I'm not gonna run this because of time, but what I would do is just go down to the bottom here on this pre-run one and just walk you through what we're trying to do here. So you probably saw this earlier where what this is doing is for a given user ID, you can select a user ID and what it would do, actually, yeah, one other disclaimer, I'm not a UI guy, so the UI here is rubbish, completely rubbish. So please, don't judge me on the UI. I mean, it took me, it, <laughs> It was much easier doing ML than doing the UI. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I'm not a UI guy, so yeah. Apologies in advance on that one. Okay, so, um, so here basically, as you change any one of these things, so you can either, you know, you can set the, uh, the rank. Okay, I thought so, yeah. yeah. And there you can see changes. So basically what it's doing is, it's saying that for a given recommendation, these are the closest other items, yeah, which are kind of similar to that recommendations for a given user. Yeah, that's what it's doing, essentially. 
So, and then allows you to select users and run it again, yeah, and then, and, and then you can see, yeah. Uh, as to, I've looked at some of the movies and tried to intuitively, does that make sense? Some of them make sense, some of them not totally, but anyway, uh, that could be a function of I need to do more runs and increase the epochs or something, but please have a free reign and play with the demo. So, and so that's ALS. Okay, next one is, if you remember, we talked about the so-called explainable matrix factorization. So this is the, the one that embraces this, that thing I call the explainability matrix that's used to embrace similarity, either item-item similarity or user-user similarity. So again, it's very similar to the last one. I'm not going to run the whole thing, but I'm just going to show you. So if you remember, we had this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this graphic whereby, based upon a particular user, okay, it will give you a breakdown of, for that user, these are all the movies that were, uh, for that user, these are the movies that were recommended, and it then also shows you a two-dimensional perspective of the latent factor model. If you remember, there are two latent factor matrices, one for the user, one for the item. And what you're seeing here is essentially the blues are all the recommendations, these light blues, and then the different shades of gray, um, of purple, sorry, are the explanations of those recommendations. Obviously, explanations in this case would be items, similar items. And then this cross here is just an overlay so even though ordinarily this space is all about the item latent factors, we've then overlaid on, on top of that the just one point from the user latent factor. And it's just showing you, yeah? This is quite good for debugging purposes, yeah? Because now you can start to see, okay, how well is this thing really explaining what's been recommended, yeah? Okay? Next one is... Um, Okay, so, so far I've talked about the model-based approaches. I'm now going to talk about the next three are the post-hoc approaches. Post-hoc meaning that these are the use cases where the model is a black box and then you also have this decoupled layer that does, it, does the explaining of the model. So the first one is uh, this association rules. And again, I'm not going to run the whole thing, but I mean, I just go down to the bottom here. And what we're doing here is we're saying that here is, the, here is a user so we select a user, okay, and um, we basically make a recommendation, which is shown here, and for that user, these are, sorry, we, apologies, so we select a user, let's say 242 is the ID, and then for that user, this is the explanation of this recommendation here. So it's basically saying that Dumbo and Fargo are kind of got some level of you know, some similarity, I don't know how, but then you can see the score maybe gives something away there. The score is quite low. Typically, the score should be between zero and one, so that's a very low score, so that's the sort of thing, and you can play with this. I, I mean, last night, I spent hours trying to tell myself, does this make sense? I don't want to go out there and look stupid, and <laughs> but actually, when I played around with a number of examples, the ones with the highest scores actually do make some sense which is the whole essence of this. So yes, you probably need to play with it and then figure out. I mean, what I could have done is run it for a lot more data sets, run it for much higher epochs, and then maybe filter all the low scores. Maybe put a threshold and say, only display anything greater than a 0.6 score, and then you probably start to see. Yeah. But again, please feel free to play around with that. Okay, the second one that we're gonna look at now is the nearest neighbor. Again, if you remember, this is the one where, yet again, the models, pretty much the same as the last one. It's just a black box, MF model. But what we're doing is we're using um, a neighborhood approach, KNN, to explain what the model is doing. And that's kind of what we're doing, yeah? So if I, again, show you that one, very similar to the last one in terms of the interface. Again, I'm not a UI developer, but again, so if I select any one of these, so what this is telling me is that Great Expectations has some kind of association or similarity with a Western Magnificent 7 where the score is not 0.62. <laughs> yeah. And again, you could play around with that and look at other users, etc. But think of this as I built the infrastructure. As I said earlier, what I would like to have done is do a lot more in-depth analysis in terms of 
trying to truly understand the findings, do you know, play around and do you know, kind of you know, as I said, put a threshold in there to say anything less, anything less than a, cer a certain threshold should not be part of the data sets, and then only look at the very high scores, and then start to see, okay, does that intuitively does that tell me what? Yeah, that level of testing I haven't done. You know, that level of quality assurance I haven't done, but you know. Uh, that's something that you guys can have a look at if you're interested in. And finally, we've got the um, we've got the factorization machine approach, very similar to the last two. Only difference now is we have, like before, we have the MF black box and we have the FM. Um, sorry, <laughs> go back. We have the FM black box, and we have the Lime surrogate. And in this particular case, Lime is using some kind of lasso linear regression to explain what the hell is going on. So, just like before, but the interface is slightly different now because this gives us the opportunity to actually see what is the relevance of a feature with respect to what's been recommended. So, now let's run this. So, if we run this for, let me just, so if I run this for this guy, so what it's telling me is that um, basically it has recommended contact. Um, let me just think about this now. Yeah, it's, it's recommended contact because it thinks that contact basically, um, you know, is strongly uh, aligned to you know, being a drama film, strongly aligned <coughs> to being an animation and adventure. And it's negatively correlated to sci-fi, etc. So you can see here now, this is now doing kind of similar thing to what we would do ordinarily if we were using Lime for a much more general model. It's giving us some kind of feature, it's providing us some kind of relevance uh, or feature, feature relevance or feature importance association with what the outcome is. The next step here is to then actually then, then correlate this with the recommendation itself. And that, again, was a piece of work I talked about earlier as well that also can be done. So that we actually, not only are we looking at the why, because this is just telling us the why. You know, why is a predicted value? No, this is telling us how we've explained the why, the, you know, the rating. What also would be good would be to now then try and, ex based upon the rating, then also explain the recommendation which, as we know, is a ranking of the ratings, yeah? And then see if that makes sense. And I guess on that note, uh, this, this is pretty much the end of my talk, but I'm sure there'll be loads of questions. So thank you very much. Good question, good, really good question. Um, as you can see, of course, a lot of this stuff, although the research I did when I, you know, as part of my job, but a lot of this stuff is completely in my own time. Um, but I can, at, at least at a high level, I can explain to you why this is essential for my job. For my job, it is critical that the models we build are explainable, of course, we know that. Now, as to how we communicate explainability, at what level? I think where we are right now is still at the very dev level, i.e. building the tooling to provide, you know, the, um, you know, I mean, like, for instance, I think I should, I mean, something like this, for instance, I'm not sure if a user would be interested in this, this, this visual. They just want to know in plain English, why is this thing, why are you recommending me to buy this, this financial product? Yeah? But for us as developers, this level of tooling will be quite useful. Also, equally, the other uh, kind of tooling where we are projecting you know, in, in 2D, essentially what's going on inside that black box, the latent factor models, that is quite powerful. 
The next step, to your point, is to then translate that into what I showed you earlier when I talked about explanation styles. Some of those styles are very intuitive. All of us probably use them when we go into Amazon or we use you know, um, e-commerce websites. And that's the next level. So I, I guess to be very direct, the first stage is to build a tool in. Actually, the stage I'm at right now is I've just finished the, the research you know, phase where I've looked at papers, what they do, turn that into some kind of POC, then turn that into a real tool that could be used by developers, and then from that, turn that into something that's truly explainable to the layman or, or woman, sorry. Yeah. Hopefully I answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps adding to this, how do you feel about um, the use of quantitative metrics that you also briefly mentioned on one slide in uh, the practice of developing these systems? Okay. I actually think that those are critical. So the only way we can truly um, evaluate that the mo <laughs> so it's interesting. AI is kind of interesting. I mean, as a side note, today we're talking about G um, chat GPT and safety concerns, etc. And we all know that the only way to solve that problem, even though it's a, even though it's a societal problem, actually it's a technology solution. You need AI to fix AI. It's the same here. So explainability can only be fixed by building models. But you're right. The models, the, the explainable models themselves have to have metrics that we could then use to further improve upon how we are reporting explainability. So you're right, those metrics are critical in how we evaluate the, and the, the fidelity of the models. Thanks, I mean, in my experience, I found these metrics at times to be hard to interpret. So therefore, I also rely further on methods that you presented here, which rather go into the direction of quantitative analysis rather than quantitative analysis. Correct. But um, did you make similar experiences, or did you find these quantitative metrics are clear in um, the interpretability? Um, like most things in machine learning, um, a lot of things are not as black and white as we might think they should be. So you're right. I mean, typically, it, it will be a mixture of, in some cases, using quantitative metrics, in others, using qualitative metrics. In some cases, actually, also being cognizant of the fact that the data is changing and you need to, again, be innovative in how you bring in the way you interpret either qualitative or, or quantitative metrics. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, quick question. Did you uh, uh, come across some kind of uh, literature or uh, some kind of uh, knowledge out there as to the, kind of the problem where a new user gets added to the user corpus, right? And you don't have any uh, historical record of, let's say, events, last clicks, or whatever. And what we would recommend something meaningful to the new user. What would be kind of the current state of the art for handling this kind of problem, like this cold start problem? Thank you. Yeah, so everyone knows about the cold start problem, which is prevalent primarily with uh, collaborative filtering, although it could also occur in content based. But it's a major problem with collaborative filtering. Um, I guess that was not the essence of this work. This, this work was just saying that even for models that we think you know, and we assume the data is sort of static, even though that's not the case. The real world, you've got distribution sh shifts in data. It's just simply saying, what are the tool, uh, tooling required to explain what's going on? But to your point, yes, that will be another extra thing that would have to be built into the explainability model, correct, yes. And from my understanding, um, and, and again, please don't quote me on this, there are ways of handling, you know, the, the cold start problem. That's not necessarily linked to explainability. It's actually more to do with the way you build the recommendation engine in the first place. I mean, a hybrid, uh, the hybrid approach tends to solve this problem, but there are also other strategies for dealing with cold start problems and recommendation engines. Next question, anyone? So um, in the papers where 
some of those methods were mentioned, was, was there any kind of studies on the impact on trust or on um, you know, persuasiveness or like kind of the adoption and which of these explanations maybe has a bigger impact on like the end user or even if it's an external user? Thank you. I think that's a good question. Um, I'm hoping that I'm not trying to be a politician here and try and not answer your question, but I intentionally provided examples of those different explanation styles just to kind of illustrate that this is kind of where we want to be. Uh, as per my previous answer to the, I think the first question, what this work has just kind of done the you can say the groundwork in building tooling. As to how we then move from having tools, primarily for developers, to do explainability to a point where we can then build solutions for the client, building solutions that, that kind of entail explanation styles that are truly going to make the client be trustful, you know, kind of trust what's been explained and you know, all those other facets, transpar transparency, etc. All I've done here is I've mentioned them, but I think that's kind of where we want to be. So I'm not trying to not answer your question, but I'm just saying that the work I've done so far is really more about the nuts and bolts of tooling. How you, I think there's another layer of moving from something like this to an explanation style that truly you know, draws in the client so that they truly kind of trust what's, you know, what's been explained to them. And I think that actually requires a lot of uh, even feedback knowing how, how they use the product, yeah, how they interact with the product, etc. More questions? Yeah. Uh, and so the main aim of the uh, recommendation system is to build, um, to recommend items to users that are not interesting. But how do we introduce novelty? Because we don't want to saturate the recommendation list with the same products all over again. So how is this problem solved? Okay, that's a good question. Um, again, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to not answer the question, but I'll try. So my main emphasis of this work was all about explainability, almost for the vanilla type recommendation system. There are a lot of solutions out there that deal with cold start, n uh, novelty issue, diversity issue, etc. I, I, I did not explore any of those in this work, and I want to be completely crystal clear and not be a politician, yeah, that's the case. But you're right, they are, I mean, that's another key thing with recommendation systems. Any more questions? Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, I think I got most of what you said there, thanks. Um, so the, the whole area of recommendation engines is quite vast, actually. It's, it's a very broad area. And you know, to, I mean, to what some of the folks have said earlier, you know, there's cold start, novelty, diversity. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And you're right, the explanation approach should, should consider all these other nuances that you've just mentioned. Um, as to the approach that I've adopted, I have, as I said earlier, I've taken the plain vanilla kind of collaborative filtering model using mixed factorization, assuming that, you know, pretty much, you know, the world is kind of linear or normal, okay? 
But you're right. I mean, are there all these other edge cases or, or edge case scenarios or considerations that one should also build into the explanation approach? But again, um, most of the work I've done so far, um, I won't say it's original. It's based on work that's been done by a bunch of folks who are probably much smarter than me in terms of research. They've done a lot of research. So they've provided tools that we can use as you know, ML practitioners to be able to start to build explainability of some sort. And then to your point, we can also then start to embrace some of these edge case scenarios and also use that to, to further augment the explainability solution. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I have a question. So do you have any ideas how we can Okay, I'm not sure if I got that question completely. Is your question that... Um, like in general, how do you have any sense of how the tactics you, you apply to... Oh, okay, 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 okay. To be honest with you, I actually think that explainability has come a long way now in ML. I mean, there's a lot of really accessible, open source strategies, solutions. I mean, as I said, Lime, Sharpie, there's a whole bunch of ways now to really build explainability into ML, uh, especially for the more well-known models you know, that are out there. Um, there's no excuse now for not building. When you build a model that makes prediction, there's no excuse now for not start, you know, starting to consider explainability as part of your deliverable. You know, there's no excuse. It just so happens that for recommendation engines, um, the representation of the problem is a bit different from your normal, traditional, um, you know, kind of uh, ML problem areas. And this is why, when I started reading this stuff, um, I was just mesmerized at how much of a problem explainability really is for recommendation engines. It's a big issue, yeah? But to your point, I mean, I would say, and I'm not probably an expert in explainability across the whole ML spectrum, but my observation is that there's a lot of solutions now that provides explainability for ML. I mean, it's, it's evolving, but I think there's a, you know, a lot of work that's now been done that could, can easily be borrowed. And you don't even need to do, you know, be a researcher. You just get the library and understand what's going on, and you can bolt it onto your product. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. <laughs> I don't, I'm not complaining, that's good, I mean. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, I was just wondering if you have like a reputation for an anti-hoc or post-hoc. Okay, that's a good question. That's a good question, I like that question. Okay, that's a good question, actually. Me, personally, um, as a practitioner, I have to get something delivered, and having gone through this process, I will definitely say the post-hoc allows me to build something and start to show some results. <laughs> because it doesn't have to touch the black box. I just need to figure out how to build that layer that can communicate with the black box. So I'm not sure that answers the question. I do think that if I had time to explore a much more robust model, then I will probably consider you know, the anti-hoc approach. Because it's embedded in the model. So it turns the model from being a black box into a white box model. But as I said, from a, you know, from a pragmatic p point of view, I would definitely go for post hoc. Because if I can use Lime or Sharpie or just kind of hack you know, the Lime library and do, put something in there and bolt it onto my recommendation system and it's given me something, yes. <laughs> Hopefully that answers the question.